Welcome back to another episode of Cobra Kai Companion, and I'm Peter. And Brianna. And joining us is two of the big three, uh, John Hurwitz and Hayden Schlossberg. How are you guys doing? We're great. Great. Good to uh, talk to you guys again. Yeah, we, we missed you out. Uh, missed out on you, Hayden. You were on vacation last time. Um, some rough weather in Florida. Hopefully everything was okay. I survived, yes. Yeah. So first off, congratulations on another successful season, season four, um, breaking all types of records. At one point, all four seasons was in the top 10 of Netflix, top 10. Uh, how does that feel? It was like, what, number one for like 12 days straight, at least? Uh, it's, it's been wild. I mean, we've, we've been enjoying this from the beginning since the YouTube days with you guys. And, uh, you know, the move to Netflix was awesome. And for season four to be you know, on the charts in the way that you're talking about. Uh, when, when those charts came out and we saw all four seasons in the top 10, it was sort of stunning and crazy. And uh, we're just so thrilled that so many people are enjoying the show. It's, it's just fun to see, you know, because you, you could just do the math and figure out a little bit just by the hours viewed that, you know, people are watching season one. I mean, millions of people are watching season one right now. Now, some of them are going back and watching it again for the second time, but there's just a lot of people that in the past month are giving Cobra Kai a try and tuning in and, you know, entering this, uh, this story and this journey, um, you know, where we've been at since the YouTube days, but it's, it's just getting started for a lot of people. And it's, it's really exciting. The record that impressed me the most was actually kind of a fandom record, but also you guys get to take credit for it. In 72 hours between us, we watched 120 million minutes of season four. That's a lot. That's a, <laughs> That's a lot of minutes of Cobra Kai, yes. And then 107 million the week after. I think it was, was it, uh, yeah, was it minutes or hours? I thought it was hours. minutes. Was it hours? Hours would make more sense. Hours would make more sense. It's, it's yeah. Viewed and, you know, the, the thing, the thing is a lot of the, our, you know, our competition, when you're looking at like, you know, comparisons are hour long shows. Now, granted we're on our fourth season, but you can see it's broken down by season there. And so uh, on, on that chart. So, you know, to have those kinds of numbers for a half hour show um, is, you know, implies a lot, of, a lot of viewers. So it's, uh, and we know, you know, just, you know, we get uh, other information from Netflix and data and it's all just good stuff. And, and we're, we're really excited. Like, you know, it feels like it's building in the way that, you know, you would, you would hope and dream. With the um, leading up to the release of season four, there have been some new things that we hadn't seen in previous seasons, um, maybe because this was the first season under Netflix, but we had the first time where we did a worldwide watch together of episode 401. Can you guys talk about that and how something like that came to be? You know, it was just one of those things that, you know, Netflix reached out to us and, and talked about. They said, you know, let's give, uh, you know, a select group of, of fans uh, the opportunity to see that first episode in advance. Uh, it's something that I think they may have done with another show or two. And uh, it was it was really fun. It was awesome. Uh, for us, you know, we, we look forward for us, like our, our like Christmas morning is when the show drops and then you start to see people watching it and just the reactions that are going on. You know, we care so much about, you know, the work that we're doing to, to share it with everybody is, is special for us. But to get that little tease where everybody got a little taste, not everybody, but, you know, 5,000, 6,000 people, 10,000, I forget exactly what the number was. It was some, somewhere in that range, uh, got to see that first episode it gave us a little preview of what was to come. And it was really exciting for all of us to see how well received it was. You know, we were, we were really proud of season four. We're proud of that first episode. We were excited for people to see Terry Silver, um, you know, on screen. And, you know, we have so many good things going on with all the other characters that um, it, it was special to see the audience react the way they did. And just a second. Okay, so this kind of um, level that you guys have reached with your show when you were just a couple of, you know, teenage boys off at college and writing scripts for the first time and hey, this might be fun. Did you ever dream of this? Yeah. <laughs> I yeah? <laughs> yeah? Dad and I, you know, have our big time dreamers. I'll say that. Like, and very ambitious in our aspirations for like what we want to do and 
you know, the thing is, it's not easy and you don't get the money that you want all the time. You know, the Harold and Kumar movies that, you know, are as big scope as any movie almost uh, when you actually are looking at what's on the page. Uh, and, you know, you get uh, $9 million to make the first one. It's, it's enough to make a movie. And but, you know, we're always thinking big and, you know, we're hopeful that that would become a franchise and that became a franchise of movies. And so when we I just remember when we got on um, w- when we kind of had our initial meetings about Cobra Kai and I got involved and started got in the early days of pitching. I remember talking to another writer and saying, like, I think we like have the Karate Kid now, like, like, like we have this world that we're now the main creative voices on because it just kind of been um, off to the side and realizing the value that was in that at the time and really feeling like, you know, I mean, there's a lot of IP out there, but this is something that has a lot of accessibility to people. And if, you know, people are going to want to tune in just to see the train wreck, if it is a train wreck, you know, like it's that level of, you know, IP. So if we can make it, a little bit better than a train wreck or maybe good it you know so I think that we had we were very hopeful when we put this whole thing together that this could be something that could you know really connect to a generation of people that grew up with it but that we we also knew that this is a movie that people show their kids so it it could have that kind of accessibility uh you know when we were hiring these young actors we were thinking hey you know what you know, this can be, you know, this feels like a group of kids that, you know, can be popular and with a young audience. So like, you know, this was the hope. Um, And, you know, but what, what's shocking is that it all panned out. (laughs) Um, Because there's more interventions that could be thrown in. Well, that's exactly the thing. I was just say like, you know, you, you know, we are, we are big dreamers. We've always, you know, when, when we were making Harold and Kumar, we wanted to compete with the biggest comedies that were coming out every year. Um, you know, we, everything that we've ever done, our, the goal has been to be, you know, reaching as, as wide an audience as possible and entertaining and bringing smiles to faces. And Karate Kid gave us that opportunity to, uh, you know, reach way far more people in, 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 in an instant way. And certainly when we got to Netflix. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's everything we dreamed of, but like it actually happening is what is crazy is, like, you know, when uh, you do, it, it doesn't feel it, it. You take a step back every once in a while and you're like, when you look at those numbers that we talked about earlier and you realize just how many people are watching it, um, it feels unreal and impossible and crazy. And uh, we're used to, you know, 20 years in this business of successes that have been good and failures that people are not aware of um and uh to be where we are at this moment is really awesome and uh, again kind of leading up to season four i know you guys like to you know listen to some podcasts and watch you know youtube channels um in terms of like predictions um based off of like trailers and teasers what were some of your Maybe uh, do you guys prefer to kind of like oh man they're they're so close or do you, are you like part of the group that prefer that we are so wrong that everything will be a surprise when we watch season four or the new season? I don't know. For for me, I I try to avoid as much of the prediction stuff as possible. I do end up seeing some of it, uh, but it, that's the thing that you know whenever I see a video that says hey predictions for the season, I never watch those. Mm. Um, but I will watch other videos where it all where predictions will start to bleed into it. Um, you know, you prefer that the audience isn't guessing exactly what's happening. Um, uh, but the fun of it is as many things that people are getting correct there are so many things that they're not going to get correct. And that's it. It's, it's, you know, we talk about the spoilers also. It's something that I think we've talked about in the past that, you know, we ourselves get frustrated as things are getting spoiled and all that stuff is happening. We're, we're, you know, we're, we're texting each other and then we have to remind each other. It's like people just saw like a little tiny, like, you know, they've seen three minutes of the show. And there's many, many hours of the show and so many twists and turns that people have no idea about. People didn't know that Stingray was going to show up or how we would use him. People didn't know the path that we were going to take Terry Silver on. People didn't know Tori and and uh, Amanda were going to be interacting in the ways that they do. There were so many elements of the season that people were not either predicting or being spoiled that um, 
I, I try to focus on that stuff more than, you know, the things that people get right. And when people get things right, you know, more power to them, you know, that everyone's in their own private writer's room. That's the way I look at it. It's like, we all have the challenge. We've all seen the material up until this point. You know, you guys have seen the seasons up until, you know, when we're in the writer's room, when we're, when we're brainstorming too. So, you know, there are a lot of talented people out there. There are a lot of people who understand storytelling. There are people who are looking at the, at the different possibilities. And, you know, our goal in the writer's room is to try to sometimes deliver to deliver a lot of the feels or certain moments that people maybe are hoping for, but in ways that are unexpected or to do things that are completely take people by surprise. So, you know, it, it's, uh, it's the, the, the prediction process is definitely an interesting one. And, uh, you know, one that I welcome, but try to avoid. Nobody, I think predicted though, what we actually ended up doing, um, in season four. And I, I like that. Because uh, I, 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 you know, I do monitor it a little bit. I, I, but I feel like even if we did say, if you did know what was going to happen, I think the journey to get there, it's not just like, you know, you could throw all the dots out there, but the, the fun is connecting all the dots. And, and even if you were to connect the dots, it's like, it's to, to live it and, and to watch it and to go through it and to go through the journey of the characters is as much the experience as, hitting those moments so i mean it does affect things and and it's a bummer when you know we we know that a couple people are like thinking you know wait waiting for hawk's hair to change and all that stuff like you know it's it's like fucking jacob you know and uh that like the the little bit of purple thing that that was there in that one moment that got out and you know we talked and we joke about it with jacob at, at all times about like how like now we have to like you know, super, you know, cover things down because, you know, you, you know, you guys are, are, you know, you're crazy. Uh, the way that you watch every little thing, it's, it's like, it's nuts. So, you know, on any other show, we wouldn't be like worrying about this stuff or wouldn't have to worry about like the, a sliver of something that zoomed in on the background, but. You know, this well, is speaking of uh, zoomed in on the background, um, you actually contributed to some of the spoilers that got out, you and Josh. Uh, why did you have the note cards for 402 hanging on the wall behind you? Uh, yeah, you know what? Okay, so here's, here's what that was. So now you've seen that Sony commercial that came out recently, right? Yes. Yeah. So, um, so John, Josh, and I, Sony asked us to be in this commercial, and they took it upon themselves to create a little set of what our writer's room would be. And like, we're coming up with this idea. And we weren't even a part of that. We were busy dealing with a million things. We show up on this set and, and we're like, well, you, they did a really good job here. And we realized they took some of the stuff from our writer's room and like orchestrated it in a way that felt even more writer's roomish than how we did it. And some of those things involved note cards that we had for season four. And we, you know, I think while we were shooting that commercial also on the side did some, uh, you know, some other videotaping for some other things. And yeah, it was a QA. and a I asked you if you were Terry Silver's secret son and that's the that's one watch right. party grabbed up. We, we did it there and it was just, it was something that we didn't, uh, you know, it's, it's all happening in the moment and you realize in retrospect that it has those those cards on the wall. Well, the, those cards, it was one of those things where, again, we didn't, we had nothing to do with those cards being put there. There was like artwork from our offices were taken and put there. We had no, we didn't know any of this was happening. Uh, so when we show up on the set, you know, we were, you know, to be honest, we had a little bit of anxiety. We we're going to be in front of the camera, like not having, not, this is comfortable for us. Just talking to people about Cobra Kai is not, is normal and we can do this all day long when it comes to like sort of acting even though we were acting as ourselves and that that was weird for us it was not like something that we're used to doing so i think there was probably a little bit of anxiety going on there and then beyond that it was like we show up we see all this stuff we're like this is a cool set we did see the note cards were there and we're like we gave them like a quick glance and we're like ah this doesn't give away too much here and we didn't really pay that close attention but then when we filmed that other the q a thing that was, you know, again, it was, you know, just quick decisions happened. Uh, and it was, I actually liked when that happened at the time. Um, I was just upset that like, we didn't have, we have some certain joke cards that have been on the walls for years. Um, there's one that's Bert shits in a tuba is on the wall. 
and it's not a, it's it's never going to be on the show. It's it was, just one it, of the it cards. Was, it was a legit season two card, I think, that we were talking about. Like, you know, these are the types of '80s hijinks that, like, you know, could have happened back in the day. That some of you know Johnny's squad could, like, you know, partake in in a in a turf war. And I, at some point, like, I think we had the idea of bird shits in a tuba. And, and it, it's on the wall every season. It's always on the wall of our of our writers' room. And I thought it was there that day. And I wish that that was like I I was upset that like when people were zooming in that we didn't have the Birchits and a tuba card. Imagine imagine the the hijinks that would ensue at that uh, marching band uh, rally. Anyway. Continue. Owen's gonna find this out now because Owen. I was has gonna it. say, does Owen know that exists? I don't think Owen knows about that card. Now he does. Hmm. Um, let's let's uh, go ahead and get into the season four here. Um, kind of starting off in the early beginnings. Season three ended with uh, the two dojos coming together. Let's begin. You know, great Phil Collins cover, and and we start off with season four already. You know, this doesn't seem like it's gonna work. You know, we're gonna train together, but you know, different dojos on opposite sides of the uh, of the um, of the dojo, but can you guys talk about like why starting this off there when you guys worked, you know, most of season three to get us together? Well, I mean, it, we worked to get them together. Now working together is a different ball game, working together with different philosophies. And we just felt that like, don't you want to enjoy the conflict and, you know, that, that would naturally arise in trying to mesh and trying to be, you know, one unit and, you know, that conflict leads to tension, you know, for story, but also comedy. And we wanted to play both. Um, you know, it's, it's, I think, true to life. Anybody that has two different philosophies that's, you know, trying to work together are going to butt heads. And, you know, I think that, you know, we know that the audience, you know, wants them to be together. So we were, you know, it was, we wanted to kind of, we're always like psyching you out, like, oh, like, you know, I think the, the goal of episode one is like you're watching them you're like oh no don't tell me they're gonna fucking you know split apart again and then you're like okay thank you thank god that like this the kids brought them together you know and so that's that's what we're going for there i liked the feel of that particular scene um i believe the first time i saw it at the time i i would we I was on the phone with peter and i was like well if they're, if they're breaking up then somebody has to tell the kids and it just it, it felt like a divorce an impending divorce it was that, wonderful that was intentional I, I, I was i was gonna say the thing about that scene is that's actually one of those scenes that uh we haven't done this a lot but we shot us we we were shooting that scene and it wasn't working because it it ended in a, originally in a way where like daniel gets mad and throws the beer down and, and storms off. And it was like the first time, like we were in season four where it felt like you've been here before, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, I, it feels like another Johnny Daniel argument. Like I, it was getting, there's something about it that felt like I've seen this before on our show. And we just like, we actually didn't finish shooting the scene as we were shooting it. And we're like, you know what, let's this this is not working. And we went home and we realized like, well, where have we not been? And it's like this is a these this is these are two people that have already butt ahead so much that now instead of storming off, they're just in that defeated place. <laughs> you know, they're in that place of like that we haven't seen before, and really play this as you know, two, two like a couple that like at the time it was like an interfaith couple that like you know maybe if you convert then we'll be able to do this. And why do I have to be the one to convert? And and it's like let's just t tell the kids like that made it fresh to us and and a way for them to part. And I think that that was a big thing with us this season. You know, in season four was we knew they were going to butt heads. We wanted it to not feel like the same thing over and over again. Peter, did you? already ask yeah oh okay um okay well let's talk about the cold open of 401 we see uh terry's end of the phone call if you want to call it that but um just the decision to shoot uh thomas from behind can you guys give some insight on that you know, we wanted to make a great reveal of Terry Silver. You know, we spent season three where you where we reveal him as a as a young man, uh, to give added backstory to make the season four, um, you know, actual you know present day Terry Silver appearance that much stronger. Uh, and 
we loved the idea of sort of making him this larger than life character. You know, we knew his talents. We knew that he was a talented pianist. Uh, we knew he's an opera singer. We know he's like, you know, got all, he's a Renaissance man. So this idea of him playing an extremely complicated piece on the piano uh, was, uh, you know, and, and to be finding him there, have the camera find him and not show his face at that point uh, was a choice. Uh, we love the idea of, you know, him getting that call. Everyone's, you know, assuming, okay, he calls Terry Silver and Terry Silver's happy to hear from him. And, you know, they're just going to get back at it. But we thought that was too easy. And with 35 years of time passing, we thought, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if in the wake of Karate Kid 3, you know, that fractured their relationship. And like, you know, Kreese at the beginning of Karate Kid 3, he's, you know, down in the dumps and everything. And they just go off and they tried this big thing and it failed. So, you know, you'd imagine that Kreese is not in a good place and that, you know, uh, it's possible that they kind of parted ways. And, you know, we chose to make it where it parted ways in a way that like wasn't particularly great. And um, to make Kreese have to earn him back into the dojo and manipulate him back into the dojo uh, was sort of the choice that we made. Uh, speaking of, you know, the, the, the scenes from uh, 401, one of the things that stuck out immediately to me, and it's both symbolic and Easter egg-ish, which is my thing, is the Cayman Estates wine. And Terry Silver, having been so out of his mind on cocaine and revenge, and the words coming out of his mouth, I terrorized a teenager for months. It sounds crazy. Just like, these are words I've said. But then you deconstructed the Karate Kid Part 3 and basically kicked Robert Mark Kamen to the curb. Um, how did, it, and he signed off on it. He thought it was oh, fantastic. Well, okay. well, well that, that's, that, you know, that, that, that interpretation is, you know, people can have whatever interpretation they want. I could say what our intention there was only a fun Easter egg. You know, we love Robert and love his wine also and felt like we needed this bottle of wine there. And it was just like, why not? You know, just like for, for people in the know, you know, and, you know, for all the negativity about kicking it, I'll just say, you know, Terry Silver likes the finer things. So he's got multiple bottles there and a magnum of it. So, you know, it's good stuff if, uh, <laughs> if he has it. Um, but, but, came, but came in like, you know, here's the thing, like Karate Kid 3 is a movie that I don't think it, it's probably not Robert's favorite movie that he's made. Um, I mean, he's made what 30, 30, more, 30 or more movies in his career, um, you know, and that was a movie that got made in a very like untraditional way where, you know, I think there was, you know, not everybody there was eager to make that movie. It was studio driven uh, to make that happen. You know, the initial, so there was initial plans that were, you know, not the way that they were going to go uh, from a studio standpoint. And then there was the whole Marty Cove being unavailable thing that led to the Terry Silver creation. There was all sorts of challenges with that, that script um, and that story. Uh, but as you guys know, we feel there's a lot of great things about that movie that we've been able to utilize going forward. Um, the cocaine thing was our, like, like we're in the writer's room and we, we've been, jo we've joked about it for a long time now that it's like, okay, that performance is over the top and crazy and the choices. Okay. Well, why does this guy do it? He's on drugs. It's the eighties. And that felt like a good solution to it. But yeah, as Hayden's saying, the, 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 the kick of the bottle was an homage. It was only with love. And if it ended up, uh, us, like, you know, smashing, the uh you know uh, the karate kid three there then perhaps but robert mark came and wrote karate kid one he wrote karate kid two um amongst he also, many he other also did create the terry silver character like what i yeah. love about it is i i know you know because we know him you know that wasn't the movie that he wanted to write but he had to kind of write this movie and then, as John said, there were issues that happened with Marty that came in. And but he was the one who wrote it and he wrote, uh, you know, he had to figure something out. And because he knew, you know, the you know, he was the one who wrote one and two. There are things in that movie that do feel true to Karate Kid and that have that that feel of the same DNA. And he created this Terry Silver character that has connections to uh, uh, Crease 
and created a backstory, you know, cared about, like, so we are learning a little bit more about Kreis. This is something that only a writer, I think, of the first two movies would have done. So, you know, I, there is no Terry Silver without Robert Mark Kamen, um, and I'll tell that to him uh, next time I see him. <laughs> uh, but also, you know, it's like things like, you know, Cobra Kai never dies. That's in that movie, you know, um, that, that originates there. And so it's all, I don't know, we're, we're I, I, I love Karate Kid 3. I see it for what it is. And we, like Christopher Nolan, take something that could be perceived as silly and try to figure out like, what is the, the grounded version of this. And uh, that's that's what we love doing with with Terry Silver in season four. Okay, on, on that note, um, you know, the Karate Kid franchise, um, you know, I, I think people do know that Mr. Miyagi has some unorthodox um, teaching techniques. Now with, with Sensei Lawrence here, the, some of them are insane, right? Like jumping off of a rooftop, um, stepping on cold, now, can you guys talk about coming up with ideas on things that Johnny would have Daniel or the other kids do uh, in, train, in terms of training? Well, we, we always joke around like, you know, Johnny, you know, the, the scene where he's training Daniel says it all in terms of his mentality. It's, it's about being a man. And there's this like, you know, real like 80s machismo that he has that like, you know, that partly the show partly embraces and partly mocks. And I think that's the fun of the show. And so, you know, when he's when he's picking all these things like the walking over coals and things like that, that feels like, OK, these are the kinds of things that you would buy that maybe either Johnny has been through in his Cobra Kai days or that when he's thinking about, well, what does it mean to be tough? You're doing that now when it comes to the jumping uh, from rooftop to rooftop. That was sort of a big choice. There were different things in the writer's room. And I don't know if um, uh, that. OK, you didn't. That's not that was not Joe and Luan, right? That was uh, yeah, I think it was Michael. Is Michael exactly? That was one of those things where we had talked initially about, you know, jumping. There was like a cliff jumping thing instead, where you're like jumping from very high up and landing in water, and it being dangerous, but maybe less dangerous than you know where we ended up being from a practicality standpoint. That we couldn't. There was no option to shoot that kind of a scene in Atlanta, and uh, you know there was definitely a, a push for. Uh, doing something that was super dangerous, but like Johnny would have his own logic as to why he's making it safe-ish, like the, like the mattresses down below. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it, it all goes back to the cement truck. You know, it's it's it goes to the swimming pool with like, you know, tying his, you know, tying Miguel up. So he's 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 ready to go for it. Um, on the flip side of that, with the Miyagi-Do training for Johnny, um, we asked Joe and Luan because it, it felt to me anyway, um, as he's teaching Johnny the wheel technique, that it would have made sense and felt right to have Daniel on the other side with him. Did you guys ever consider that? Uh, I didn't think that it was, you know, and, and I, you know, it, it may have, he may have ended up doing the wheel technique or started with the wheel technique. I don't know if he did the full wheel technique. I thought it was meant to be more a, you know, he's, you know, balancing while doing his blocking the way Daniel was on the bow of the boat and using the balance board. And that like, he had a, a start that was the same as, it's like when you're on the balance board, you have the same kind of intro kata that like maybe the, the, the wheel technique would have, but I don't think he has the exact same, he does the exact same thing there. So it's, 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 what he was doing was meant for one, I think was the logic. Well, I, I, I'll say this, I, Brianna, we know that you want to see the two of them on there. We know this is about you. <laughs> this is more about, this is more about you. Not you know, just I, me, not I just know, me. I know, not just you. It's the, 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 uh, the uh, Russo. Russo contingent <laughs> and that's fine. I'll just say this. What it was for us was simply like Johnny's teaching Daniel stuff. And so, and then this was Daniel teaching Johnny stuff. So your the focus was on Johnny having his balance on that board himself, uh, not Daniel partaking. Daniel's instructing. Did one of you get to push the button to throw Billy into the water? Or did he just legitimately fall? He just he just did his own thing, I think. Yeah, no. I, I remember being uh that was a crazy day. That was a you know double up day. I think we had multiple units going at the same time. We had a crane that was not working well. It was there were all sorts of troubles that day. Uh, but uh, Billy was totally game. We did have like a stunt guy who was falling in as well, but Billy kept doing it. 
there's some there are these moments on the show where there's the thing that like the actor's not supposed to do and we as the director tell them this is you're not supposed to do this and then they do it and you're like this is great <laughs> you're like you're thrilled that they're doing it but you don't you're it's irresponsible for us to direct him to do that but he like a guy like Billy Zabka is just like I can do that like he's not worried about like rolling over there and he did it and it was great so you guys aren't like no no billy you guys you can't do that at all we, 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 he may he may do it and then we're like you know billy you know you're not really supposed to do that like and he's like well what if i do it i'm like we can't we're we're just saying that we're we can't tell you to be doing that yeah. and then so he knows that we're we're okay line, you know like that that you know stunt stunt people are more experienced with you know freak accidents and so you know you you just that's up to the actor you know you don't want to encourage any of that stuff yeah um, right you know if they want to do it they they believe in it and you know they know that they they, they feel confident that's in the balls in their court in that those moments um uh, we, we, we didn't lead we didn't go into the scene and say hey billy if you want to do this you know you know we're not going to stop you it really was just him doing it and then after he did it it was like well uh, you know we we're we're t just reminding you we're not asking you to do this you know as far as the stunts go i know that we've seen behind the scenes from the um all valley you had sholo in wires you had tanner and jacob both in wires i'm also going to assume that ralph was not climbing a chain barehanded and was in yeah. wires as well he was in wires yes uh, it, it seemed like you had a, is that something that the new stunt team has brought in? It seemed like you had a lot more wire stunts this season than last year. Well, it's not, I don't think a, I, I, um, I think it's just a matter of, we had a lot more things that required uh, wires. But we've, we've used wires before, you know, obviously when, show, when uh, Miguel falls off the balcony, that was a big wire thing. And there were, there were other, there were other, we've done wire stunts over the year. Uh, Robbie, when he does in season one when he does the handstand thing mm. uh, and, and, Ra and Ralph also there. So we've done it. I think it just, uh, that, that wasn't really the big difference with the, the, the stunt teams. Um, you guys also gave us something that a lot of us have been waiting for over three decades, uh, a rematch with the senseis. Can you guys uh, give some insight on um, kind of breaking that, that bullet point and, and uh, just kind of writing the, the scene? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, we just felt that, you know, I know that the fans want them to stay together and everything to work out, you know, but I think we just felt that going into the, the season for the mo the big, the best story, the most entertainment value would be ultimately, you know, they, they, they split up and, you know, again, we, we try to think of like ways that felt fresh about that. And, you know, the idea of, Johnny not liking Daniel's relationship with Miguel and the the reverse with Daniel and Johnny's relationship with Sam. Well, that's something we haven't seen yet on the show. And that felt like it's a good enough reason to kind of bring these two people, you know, at odds at the bar, you know, Johnny says, oh, so now you know what's best for Miguel, huh? Like that's ultimately what that fight is about. Um, and you know, and, and, and so we we're like, OK, well, if they're going to split up, like, how do they do it? And, and it just felt like the most entertaining way. And we love like the idea of like, oh, my God, it's like the senseis are fighting later, like the kids getting behind it and they kind of becoming a thing. And, you know, we just we love the idea of that. Obviously, you, know, you talk about who's going to win that fight. And we decided, you know, it would be uh, a draw. Um, but that was that was the mentality going in. And we knew that, like, oh, my God, like this is something that you could save for the end of the series, but that was never our original intent uh, for that. And, and you know, there's still plenty of more possibilities for the two of them to spar, but that, that felt like, what would they be in a actual competition over that makes sense? It, like something that they arranged made, made a lot of sense to us. Um, when it comes to the, the All Valley, um, okay, it, it, dumb question or not, I guess. Why, when they combined again at the finals and became Eagle Fang, why didn't they just combine dojos and pool their points so they would win? 
they weren't really able to do that. I mean, it was they when they entered the tournament, it was Miyagi Do, it was Eagle Fang. It was really at the end, it was Johnny helping Daniel, uh, you know, with um, you know, coaching in in the very end there. It, it, you can't really go to the All Valley board and suddenly say, hey, you know, for this very last fight, now we're together. So hey, let's just pull our points. And then, and- then you think like Topanga and Locust Valley is just suddenly gonna join forces in the middle. What are you talking about, Brianna? Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's 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 you think the All Valley board <laughs> would back up a million miles. Do you think do you think that Ron would allow that? Raw, you know, he, he he probably the mood he was in that day, he would have. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, well I guess if Daniel LaRusso asks him, maybe time, you're right. They have a hard enough time keeping track of the point system, you know, <laughs> it's a Byzantine system that, like, you know, there's a logic to it and a lot of thought that went into that point structure. And they're, they're, they're monitoring that. They, they can't, you know, the idea of like combining forces like that is, is not that's not going to be kosher for them. Was it always oh. your intention to have Daniel be the one to point out that Johnny was also a two-time champion? It, it was, it was, it was, I mean, it was, it wasn't like, it, you know, when we started the series, we weren't thinking, okay, well, we're going there. But, you know, when we were working on that episode, we, that was, you know, a choice in the writer's room that we thought would be a great moment for, uh, for uh, both characters, for Daniel to be the one who, uh, who points that out. I have a follow-up question to my previous one about the sensei versus sensei fight. Um, there's a point where Daniel has to bust out the, you know, the the the, the pressure point, you know, the, what he just learned from from Chosen. Um, is that something that was supposed to kind of mirror where in Karate Kid 2, where he does a crane kick and uh, Chosen is able to kind of stop him? Or was that more like Daniel is uh, thinking that Johnny is just a comparable opponent that he feels he has to use what he feels is probably like the like worst case scenario i have to use this to disable him i think it's the latter and but like but it reminds us of the karate kid 2 thing because it it feels like okay here's a here's a move from the previous entry and it doesn't work so it has that same effect and i i like that because it's just like sometimes in movies they it's like it's like well, did the character forget that thing? It's like I would have been, I would, it would have frustrated me that Daniel didn't use the crane kick against Chosen. You know what I mean? And it's like, so now he's fighting Johnny. Does he really care about winning here? You know, like he's got the pressure points thing. He like, you know, so we we figured, you know, it would make sense for him to do whatever it takes in that moment if he wants to, if he really cares about, you know, his kids and the daughter and all that stuff. It, it felt um, Johnny's reaction, I thought, was fantastic because the last time Johnny had seen him do that was to Crease. So suddenly here Daniel is beating on him like he was beating on Crease. Um, and he felt really, he, he sounded really, really offended. Yeah, I think he was just, it, it, the whole moment was just a crazy moment for him. It's like, what, what's going on there? But we liked how Johnny was able to, like, you know, he despite like, you know, being limp, in certain ways, he was still able to find, uh, you know, find a way to continue the fight. Um, and, uh, you know, we loved ending it in a draw in the way that we did. Uh, you know, we're not ready to have one of these guys. Suddenly it's like, oh, no, he's the better fighter or his philosophy works better. No, it's, uh, you know, they're, they're evenly matched and they always have been. They always will be probably. <laughs> probably. <laughs> um Let's talk about some of the the other characters that the kids specifically uh, earlier we kind of uh, touched on Hawk and and the shaving of the of the mohawk. Uh, can you talk us through a, a decision to to have that taken away from him? Was that to kind of revert to Eli, or was it like, well, these these fans, you know, they're they're gonna guess all the colors every season, so we gotta do something different. No, it's it's just we're thinking we always think about every character and their story and. We love the idea that, you know, we knew going into this season that Hawk is going to be a tar- have a target on his back because Cobra Kai is viewing him as a traitor. And, you know, it just felt like the natural thing that like, oh, that's like a unique way of, you know, what are they going to do, kill him? Maybe, who knows, <laughs> you'll see in season five. But like in season, you know, like for the the story, we're like, oh, that, that would be humiliating for him. It, it, it calls back to the Bible and Samson and losing your power 
and finding that inner power within was it the mohawk that gave him all the strength or can he find it you know like can he find that hawk within the eli and find that balance those those were things that I think I remember talking about in, when we were shooting season three, that that's like where we were going to go. Yeah, we, we knew about that for a while. And also, you know, Terry Silver, there was the talk of no fighting before the tournament. Well, cutting his hair off, that's not fighting. There was an element. It was a little bit of a loophole also. So it kind of uh, all worked worked together. I, I thought it was, um, I mean, they were strangling him to hold him down. So I'm like, that's got to qualify as a fight. <laughs> um, well, they went there just to cut his hair. The fact that he started attacking them, they had to defend themselves. In I'll just, say, oh, I'll just say that was, yeah, that, 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 that was one of those things that, you know, our stunt team and Jacob, it became like a bigger thing than what it was actually planned. It was like, it was meant to be like, okay, he's getting a tattoo. So he's in a very vulnerable spot. And like, they just kind of get him while he's down and then do it. And, but of course, Jacob wants to like take out a couple guys. And by the time we like, we see what they have planned for the stunt, it's like, it was more, it's always more elaborate. And sometimes that's like the best thing uh, that our stunt team does is like they, they more bells and whistles. Like you'd think sometimes it's like, okay, this is too much. And sometimes you do have to rein it in because it just gets too, you know, maybe unrealistic, but um that was one of those things I remember on the day being like, okay, like we actually had, I think that is toned down. I think from what it was when we first saw no, it. But it was great though. I, I just remember like, you know, uh, like when it first came up the idea of expanding that and having like a little bit of like, you know, don't just let Jacob just be held down and do this. Like let's give him some fight and, and build it into something. Uh, when they, I remember them taking, uh, at least I know I went back there. I don't know if, uh, if you or Josh were there as well, but I remember being taken back there. Like, here's what we're thinking. Okay. Like we think it should be like a little bit more. And then I saw it. I was like, this is awesome. This is going to be great. So, uh, you know, some, sometimes these things just show up that way. Uh, Jacob had a um, fantastic turn, I think as Eli slash Hawk slash Eli in season four. Um, I thought it was very poignant that he was the one that brought them together uh, considering that he kind of screwed them both over in the last two seasons. Um, was there ever talk of him having an actual, I hate my dogs, sit down conversation with Daniel about what had happened at the dojo? I know Chris brought it up, but mm -hmm. had you ever you know, talked about him broaching that subject with Daniel? No, I, I don't think so. It was one of those things where there's so much going on. You're juggling all these different characters and all the different relationships. And it's the totem pole of like, you know, what is, uh, you know, what's top of mind? What's, what's the biggest priority? And I think Daniel being, fr Daniel being frustrated with Johnny and being like, what did you think was going to happen? Like, like, like that felt authentic to us. That, that felt like it's Daniel showing that like, you know, yeah, I've let, this kid into my backyard because everyone's here but this guy like did some messed up things here and you know he's somebody that like you know i'm not interacting with individually in a in a major way but i'm allowing him to be a part of this thing and you know when they do interact in that moment they you know it, it hits hawk like he's you know probably not surprising that johnny is you know sweeping him like crazy and having you know using him as a punching bag because he's earned that and daniel's equally right to be you know, frustrated with this kid. He's already frustrated at Johnny. So maybe if it was, if he didn't have Johnny, uh, the Johnny frustrations, he probably would have handled it maybe softer. But Daniel has every right to be, you know, anti-Hawk at that moment. So we thought it was important for the journey of that episode to not just be, hey, okay, Hawk's here and everyone's cool with it. No, like everyone needed to work through it and he needed to prove himself and do something um, to show that he's changed. And that's where that's where we went and in, you know, having that, you know, spar uh, the Okinawan sparring deck came about. I know we're running um, out of time with you guys, so I'll probably maybe we, ask we can, a couple more we, questions. We, we can go a little. We can go a little bit long. I think. We okay. Can probably, okay. We can um, to, let's see here. Let's, minutes, you guys. Uh, let's oh, talk you. about some of the, um, the, the the new characters. You you guys mentioned. Uh, you know, you guys wanted uh, characters that that you know that the fans would like, basically. Um, Uno, uh, Una O'Brien plays uh, Devin, who is, is a bit of a little firecracker. You know, um, I really love her introduction. She's on the debate team, probably a nod to you guys, I'd imagine. Um, can you guys talk about writing that character? We just, um, we knew <laughs> that we were gonna need more, um, you know, female karate fighters, uh, but more importantly, 
we knew that we needed people that like didn't know karate, you know, uh, going into season four, because after season three, you know, a lot of our characters that you're following, a lot of the kids are like now on, you know, feel like, you know, they're, they're not underdogs anymore. Like they're all like competing on a level, which is exciting. Um, but what is Karate Kid about? It's about, you know, using karate to overcome the issues that you're going through. And so going into the season, we're like, you know, we need some new characters that are that have never learned karate before but that are entering into this world it'll it'll give those karate kid vibes about it um but you know we don't want to just cut to kids randomly it's like why how are they tying into the story and so for Devin, it was perfect you know johnny needs female fighters and like you said you know john and i um have a history of being in debate and we were very cocky kind of debaters back in the day, you know, it's, it's this really nerdy world, but like within the nerdy world, you know, you have these kind of the, uh, these, you know, characters that like are, you know, like Devin, you know, kind of very passionate. And, you know, we love the idea that Johnny sees somebody in there that has the fighting spirit. That's exactly what he's looking for, that he doesn't have to teach. It's just, like, she's a natural. He could see that. And all, all she needs to do is learn a couple of the moves, like a technical thing. And like the energy will just kind of uh, fast forward her to where, you know, he needs to take her. And that was the fun. But it, it wasn't just us, though, who, who were debaters. Matea, Matea Green, who I know you've met uh, mm -hmm. before. Matea uh, wrote that episode, um, I'm pretty sure. And I know she was in debate. So that's one of the things that we've talked about, like, you know, that we, we have a shared history and debate. And, uh, you know, so she was certainly inspired by her own uh, debate past as well. Um, yeah, I, she's someone to look forward to, Devin, um, just because I really like her line about her taking pride in not uh, making the same mistake twice. So um, I think that's very deliberate and I uh, can't wait to see more of her in season five. Yeah, no, she um, She's just one of our fate. She was, you know, it's it's frustrating that you know, you, you know, there's times where it's it's a half hour show, and you know, we 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 want to spend more time with all these characters. Um, but that's what's also good about it is like, okay, well, it makes it where like, oh, season five now it's like uh, we weren't able to do some stuff that season. Maybe we can you know explore more. One of the things I liked about Devin is she's quite possibly the first character in 35 years to mention, I'm not going to be upset. I've been doing this for six weeks. I'm amazing, you know? Um, so I thought that was a, a great little nod to all the people that are like, yeah, like he earned a black belt in six <laughs> weeks. Well, you know, he did. It, it just is, it happened. So. Yeah, no, we, we love her. Like we love that point of view on the show. She's one of those people who is like outside of the karate drama, but quickly gets involved in it, but has that she's very smart, very quick. Um, has great perspective and she's she's a fine character to write for and she's a great performer. Uh, Una is fantastic. Uh, and, uh, you know, we think uh, the character has a bright future and she has a bright future. I, I'll just say, Brianna, that uh, time and age are not things you could really you should really be delving too much into in this franchise uh, because we stay true to the franchise. Uh, the Karate Kid has always had a murky relationship with the amount of time it takes for certain things to happen and the age of characters and the consistency of that age that was built into the franchise. And we honor this franchise, as you know, um, more than yes. anybody honors any franchise. So if you're going to like delve into well, what age is this character and this and how long does it take for this character to become a black belt? You're, you know, you're going to see the cracks in the Truman Show that were, you know, <laughs> That, that's going on here so just enjoy the ride enjoy so don't the ride. mention that sam was driving when she was 14 don't mention just, that at all just stop <laughs> stop it brianna <laughs> you know, like, enough but, you know sometimes in this world characters are kind of forgetting their own age or when things happen there's a murkiness there's a murkiness in this world you have to every movie every franchise has their own rules their own thing some franchises have l like lights that can be sabers okay okay it, it doesn't really exist in the world but you just accept it and this we accept a couple things karate is the this number one huge thing in the valley and things like 
time, sometimes when it takes like how fast it takes for certain things to happen, it can, things happen in a certain way that lead to exciting story. I don't know what to say. Perfect. Yeah. I'll just replay that clip anytime she brings that up in one of our reviews. Like, <laughs> I've been suitably chastised in public a couple of times by you guys. So maybe I should kind of stop. <laughs> On the flip side of uh, De Devin, we got the introduction of Kenny, a uh, fantastic st story. There's, um, it, it sounds like you guys really uh, took a lot of time into kind of creating his, his world with having to be the man of the house while his brother, Sean, from season three is locked up in jail. We get some more backstory of Sean as well. Can you guys talk about creating Kenny, uh, Kenny Payne? You know, it was, it, as Hayden was saying, we wanted, you know, characters that didn't know karate yet. We wanted characters that, um, you know, you could instantly fall in love with and who had the ability to go through an arc. Uh, so we, this was a, another complex character. It goes back to when we were casting in season one and you're like meeting actors for Miguel or meeting actors for Hawk. I and mean, you're like, you need to see the different sides of the performance. That was what we were doing when we were auditioning for Kenny. Um, and uh, first of all, Dallas is a star immediately. The moment we saw his audition, we're like, okay, it must be him. Uh, I know that he was uh, technically, he was a series regular on, there was like a, a Goonies-ish type show that was happening and he had filmed the first, uh, the pilot for it. And we didn't know if it get picked up or not, but we were willing to hire him without knowing for sure that we could kind of control his schedule because he was that fantastic. Um, and, uh, you know, luckily that should, show didn't go. And now he's a series regular for us, but that character was, uh, you know, we, it, it, part of it was us knowing that we wanted to bring Anthony LaRusso into the story in a bigger way. We've known since maybe season one that we had this idea of eventually Anthony become being a bully. And that being the story that it's like this, the, the greatest underdog who was bullied in the 80s, Daniel LaRusso, for him to experience having a child who actually is bullying others felt like an interesting piece of story for Daniel. Um, and that and it would be an interesting angle for Anthony. And in turn, okay, who's he bullying? So then you're figuring that out. And you you want to create a fresh new character, but you want that character also to tie into the universe in some way. So you're thinking about Sean, and you're, you're thinking about Robbie, like you know all those different ties that and Robbie to how Robbie ties to the Larussos and all that. Like you know, you're, there's a lot that goes into it. So uh, that character was uh, one that we were very excited about. Uh, once we saw Dallas perform, we were even more excited, uh, and uh, that 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 arc in the season is one of our favorites and uh you know we, we had a we had a lot of fun with uh, the middle school kids if you think if you think about it you know kenny and anthony and that storyline you know we it could have just been oh let's introduce the new class and you're just like okay they're just bringing in new characters and we're supposed to care about these characters now but that storyline ultimately where it pays off is robbie coming back to johnny at the end of the season because uh, of what he learns from Kenny. And ultimately, Daniel learning to accept Johnny um, as he deals with parenting Anthony later in the story. So it's like, you know, again, it's, it's we're bringing, as John said, we're bringing these new characters in and we're getting all these Karate Kid vibes of like, you know, going back to the roots of bullying and kids learning karate for the first time and all that stuff, you know, where it could have just been, all right, now it's just like fifth, sixth level karate kids on a ultimate competition. That's not what this franchise is ultimately about. And, you know, bringing that all in, but connecting it in a way where it, it affects the characters we care the most about. Um, and then along the way, now you care about Kenny. Now you care about what's gonna happen with Anthony next season. And, and we, we get to play that out in season five. That once again, you've, you've set us up with a rivalry that we're completely in love with both sides of. Um, noticed uh, you might be fans of Damon Wayans just a little bit. Um, <laughs> major, major pain. Yeah, yeah. That was an accident. That is the greatest thing ever. How that, that was an happened. accident. It was an accident. <laughs> it was. It was his. The, I mean, Sean Payne. We knew the name Sean Payne. Right. Um, we create. We came up with the name Kenny Payne randomly. Like we weren't thinking 
And we knew that there was a military element that we had. And we realized after the, like, after the fact that, wait a second, his dad has major pain. That wasn't something that was intended. That was something that like we stumbled upon. That's like, amazing. After the fact, when? Because even- well, We were on pain. set. We were on set okay. realizing it. Like it was- yeah, not, it was his, his tag is obscured. I think still maybe holding off to the surprise of Sean at the end of that episode. Yes, yes. yes was, we were that that purposely- was, that was the wardrobe thing that like we just weren't aware of. There's a million things that happen. And then all of a sudden on the day, we're like, wait, it says pain right here. We can't show the audience this. Like it's supposed to be a surprise at the end. So we're like, you know what? Uh, he's holding a bag here during the scene. And it's like- he sits down with the bag still on, you know, it just, it is, hey, it, he was, he was on the phone in the middle of a call, you know, and, and didn't want to take the bag down, but that, but, was, but that was one of those things where it was just like, everything's happening all at once, you know? But it, yeah, that was an accident and it was great. It, we were very, we were happy when we, when we realized that it, like it, you know, that, that it came together that way, but that was not, that was not our intention from the beginning. So that's the oh, same funny. as the art department, because I had asked you about the wine bottle. When it rains down, it's actually raining down on a blurred version of the Johnny and Daniel section of the season four poster. It's I, raining I, down on their heads. I, I, I was not aware of that at all. I heard that you, you say that, and I, I'm not, I, that hasn't been confirmed to me. We need so. to ask the art department, because yeah, that was I, immediately what I, I was like, that's the poster. I trust you, but that was the first I had heard about it. So yeah, I don't yeah. know. That's awesome. Hmm. Interesting. Brown, did you have one? Uh, yeah, um, just wanted to thank you for the brilliance of having Julia Macchio psychoanalyze her father's parenting skills. Brilliantly, she's she's phenomenal. She's she's great. It, it was you know we we've known Julia since season one. Uh, she and the family would come and visit uh, Ralph, and we got to know her and. She's one of the sweetest people that we know. She's so, she's just a joy to be around and she's extremely talented. Uh, so, you know, we, this was certainly not a scenario where Ralph is pushing us to put his daughter on the show. This was a scenario where we're like, wouldn't it be awesome if we could find a spot for Julia on the show that, uh, that would make sense. And we're like, she has to be related to the LaRusso somehow because she looks so much like Ralph. Mm -hmm. That like, you know, she's got to be related. And we're like, oh, what if she's Louis, Louis, she's got to be Louis' sister. And we knew that she was able to do that kind of accent and do that kind of performance. Uh, and yeah, to have her criticizing um, uh, Daniel's parenting was, was so much fun for us, especially given the love that there is between, you know, father and daughter. And, you know, frankly, Daniel with his whole family is, uh, it's a total love fest and it's the best. I mean, Ralph and his family, as a Daniel and his family. Right. Uh, oh, well, Daniel's too. Daniel Macho. Yeah, Daniel, Daniel as well. Yeah, and Daniel's been on the, Daniel's been on, now you just got to get Phyllis on an episode, right? Yeah, there you go. Oh, yes, yes, exactly, Daniel, yeah. Not Daniel. Um, yeah, we need Phyllis on, you're right. Yeah, uh, in season four, we saw uh, some characters return. Piper returned, joins Cobra Kai, but also a huge surprise, uh, Aisha. Uh, you know, shows up and gives Sam some um, words of wisdom. Can you talk about uh, Aisha's return? Listen, we just, you know, we love all the characters the way the fans are. We're fans. You know, we we think that, you know, um, you know, when you haven't seen a character in a while and they come back into the story, there's like, you know, excitement and oomph that happens. And, you know, we're always looking for those moments. And so, you know, we thought, okay, like, you know, in Sam's journey, you know, I mean, you know, her, her mom is, is striking a deal with Tori. Like, you know, it'd be like, she can't talk to her parents right now. Who, you know, who's she going to be talking to moon maybe, but like, you know, we, we thought this is the time that, you know, she would maybe uh, venture outside of the San Fernando Valley and, uh, and find Aisha. And uh, yeah, no, it was fun, uh, you know, seeing and working with Nicole again. And obviously, you know, she, takes what Aisha says and applies it her own way. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a surprise there, but yeah, ultimately that was, uh, that was something we talked about in the room is, you know, as a fun way of getting her involved in the story. Um, the way that you guys play with expectations, we know we've been here for, you know, four years, you do it all the time, you do it fantastically. 
we were expecting when Carrie Underwood stepped out on that mat, we were expecting you're the best. And what we got was the moment of truth. So what went into, I assume you didn't like make her the job offer on Twitter, even though, you know, she spelled the show name wrong and all that. Uh, how did that come about? You know, it, it, it started with story. It started with uh, episode six, where the All Valley Board, who are, you know, as I think you guys know, we love those characters. They're like our writer's room. They're trying to make a spectacular uh, All Valley tournament as we're trying to make a spectacular show. So we go, we're going through the same kind of, uh, uh, you know, choices. Um, we always thought, we thought it'd be funny for Ron to, uh, uh, to be want, always wanting there to be like some celebrity at this thing and hence the Malcolm Jamal Warner incident that didn't go well. So as we were, uh, you know, uh, writing the the episodes with the All Valley Tournament, we were like, okay, we're going to have, we, we need to have a celebrity co come there. And I'll say it was our writer, Bob Dearden, in his script, um, who came up with the idea of having a celebrity performer singing the moment of truth over the course of the early rounds of the karate tournament as a way to dynamically pass time. And, you know, there's a lot of karate that you're watching and you want to mix it up. So to have an awesome song playing as they did in the karate kid with you're the best around, I think for us, we felt like doing the exact same thing, playing you're the best around during that same thing would feel like, okay, Hey, remember this, everybody. And for us, this felt more like the, the, the having a celebrity performer thing was a unique thing to this show and to the story that was going on there. We had, we brought Carrie Underwood in because, you know, she did express her fandom despite her, uh, her, her misspelling of the title. She quickly apologized for that and was a giant fan, a true fan of the show and her family was. So we reached out, we said, you know what, it would be really funny if, you know, uh, the bar is set at a certain level with the karate board with Ron and the mistakes of the past. What if he over delivers? What if he brings in a giant star and we have the logic of it? You know, he, he's we made it where he's an oral surgeon and, you know, her husband is a hockey player. So it's logical that there would be, you know, teeth issues. So he was able to, to pull that uh, pull that favor in. And it was really a spectacular day. We chose the moment of truth because it is a karate kid. Uh, a, a song from the Karate Kid. It's it's a lesser known song, but a song that we think is fantastic and we think was uh, was uh, topical. Uh, it was on story for that time in the tournament, and we thought it gave the same types of energy uh, that a "You're the Best" around thing would would give in the midst of that. And uh, on set, it was awesome. It was great. To, the performance was great. It shocked the crowd. And when we watch the montage, it's uh, it's a lot of fun for us. Uh, can you talk about uh, Robbie's journey this season where early on we see him teaching Miyagi techniques to Cobra Kai and where we see him um, at the end of 410 apologizing to to Johnny and uh, in that hug. Uh, it's a great journey. Uh, no, we. Uh, I don't know. We just loved the, you know, Robbie was a character that season three, you know, we talked to, to Tanner and we said, listen, this character is going to be in a dark place this season. He's going to be thrown into a hole. We're going to have episodes where he's not even there and the whole world moves on without him. And then when he comes out, he's going to be, you know, powerful, scary, vulnerable, and all these different things. And, and, and it led to a character that we were very excited about at the beginning of season four, um that is on the one hand you're nervous for because he's got terry silver crease tory all these bad influences around him but the one thing that we that we thought was he's not just this empty vessel that like okay like is easily tricked he's somebody who's been tricked enough and has had enough experiences that he's skeptical that's part of his problem is that he you know is coming off of what happened with Daniel, not trusting of anybody. So, you know, his mentality is, you know what? I'm gonna use Cobra Kai right now. I'm gonna use this and I'm gonna be here because I could, you know, get back at my dad. I could get back at everybody. I could do all this stuff. I'm not gonna fall for priests and all the silver stuff the way my dad did. I'm gonna do things. So it's like, he's got that, uh, like that maturity, but immaturity 
um, that's, that's going on this season. And part of that is I'm going to teach this kid. I'm going to show things, you know, him the right way. And so it's a really kind of, it's, it's a, it's an interesting growth in character where you feel like he's more powerful karate wise, and he's more experienced, you know, in terms of life, um, but on a bad path. And ultimately, you know, that was the part of the thing with Kenny is, you know, you get to, to see firsthand, you know, uh, where, you know, somebody else's arc is looking bad, you know, it makes you look and reflect on yourself. And at the end of the season, you know, he goes to Johnny and I remember, you know, you know, we're all, you know, working on these scripts together and, and it just naturally teeing up where Johnny would be like, don't blame, you know, you know, don't blame yourself, blame me. You know, it's like, oh, I'm sick of blaming you, dad. It was like, uh, that's 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 exactly what Johnny's been looking for. But of course, there's still a lot of tension there and awkwardness, you know, um, you know, yet to be resolved. Um, so it's it's a breakthrough, but still like still more more to come. One of my favorite things about Robbie in season four is that he didn't, I mean, cause we were so scared for him at the end of season three that he was going to get sucked in, that Terry was going to brainwash him the way he did Daniel. And he didn't, he, he, there were a couple of times he got kind of close to the dark side, but he stayed Robbie all season. And then when he and Tori started falling in love, you could see them kind of pulling each other out of the darkness. And I love that parallel journey that they're taking toward the end of the season where uh, Tori is going to Amanda and Robbie is going to Johnny. Yeah, no, we, it was, you know, we love all of our characters and it's, we always love the new pairings. You know, we talked, we've talked about that in the past. And I remember in season three, when you saw Robbie and Tori kind of together and interacting in scenes alone, or where they're the primary people talking with one another, we felt like a real strong energy there. And we had de developed these characters already to have some shared struggles that, you know, they, while life goes on for others, they're the ones who are suffering the consequences of, of these things. Uh, so for them to kind of come together and find some positivity within each other, um, we thought was a, a strong thing. And yeah, th those two arcs uh, in season four, uh, were uh, were a lot of fun to write, and watching the performances from those actors was was spectacular. Obviously, you know we can talk to you guys all day about Cobra Kai, and I don't want to be too greedy with our time, so I'll just keep it to uh, two more questions from me. Um, one, I, I wanted to direct it to to Josh specifically because I believe it was Luan that might have mentioned that it was Josh's um, a suggestion to maybe have Johnny say "I love you to Robbie or the, the, the addition of Robbie's name in that when he tells Miguel, I love you. I didn't, I don't remember if that was Josh's idea or not. I, we'd have to ask him. Um, it's so funny because uh, so we've listened to some of your interviews with the writers and you're like, well, who came up with this and came up with that? Like, I almost never remember because it's a room of a bunch of smart, talented, passionate people who are all throwing out ideas fast and furious and everyone's building on each other's things. Um, I do remember that, uh, when that idea came up, I remember everyone loving it and being like, oh, like you feel it in the room. You're like, oh no. And that, that we're like, people are gonna be crushed by that moment. You're not, but you're not used to that one, that kind of one-two punch. Yes. You're not used to like that, like, oh, like, like it's so rare to have that. It's not like, um, oh my God, here's an ice cream sundae and then a punch in the gut. It is a punch in the gut, but it's like it, the ice cream sundae. It's it's like very like you almost want to cry at the ice cream sundae part. Like that's there, there's this like you know this earned sweetness there that you feel good about, but that's also like that's sad. Like there's a sadness to it itself, and then it's like no, no, and, and so it's you know it's got like so much emotion and then a gut punch. It's yeah, so, it was it, it was a very, very powerful moment. We knew in the writer's room that the reaction that everyone's having to it, you knew it in the moment that it's being written. So it's, uh, you know, it's all coming from a good place. It's, uh, you know, it's it's complicated. You, we all know that Johnny loves Miguel. That's not, uh, it, but you're all like, oh, 
why did he do that? Why, like uh, in that moment, it's the last thing that you want Miguel to be hearing. And, you know, it had an impact as you saw in the, the, the next couple episodes. It, that scene, I think much like the um, Pat Morita called the drunk Miyagi scene, his Oscar nomination. Um, I think the drunk Johnny scene just might be Sholo's Emmy nomination. If not, oh. he definitely deserves it. And, He's so good. And, yeah, and Billy, and Billy. Yeah. yeah. Billy needs to get his, um, his uh, Emmy arrears you know, for the first two seasons. Yeah. It's frustrating because you have, you know, this is obviously that tweener thing between comedy and drama. And that scene kind of, it has both when you really think about it. And, and the comedy is on a whole other meta level if you've seen the original movie. So it's like, there's a lot going on in that scene comedy wise. And then like, we just talked about this crazy emotional one, two punch. And, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. And it's like, how, how do you, how do you honor, like that that in some ways deserves more honors than what an emmy to me could provide like that, <laughs> well, i'll just see what, what's mixed no, in noble prize territory i think in, but in, what, in, mo what most people also don't realize or even talk about is that johnny's singing uh playing with the boys, the boys. from top gun yeah from top, from top gun which is like earlier in the season he's anti top gun but clearly he likes it so like it's there's so much going on in that one That's scene. His version of Miyagi's song is it's yeah, exactly. It was very well done. I loved it. Yeah, it's wow. I just have two really, really quick questions and then I am done. And they are All really right. silly. One, do you guys still have your hockey jerseys with your names on the back? Or did you have to surrender them to Frank? No, we we have those. Frank Frank gave them to us. They were designed with, with the intention that Frank would let them go. Awesome. And Hayden, how do you like the new house? <laughs> uh, it's it's great. You know, it's it's fun uh, living in a new place. Although you know, there's good. You know, you know, still in the process of making all the changes and adding stuff there. All three of us moved. Just so you know, I was about to say, three, um, he's yeah, the only John, one that got a deadline article written about him. As far as I know, though. Well, I don't know. I think John and Josh get, like it's it's weird how that stuff happens in LA. I guess like there must be something where some some notification that happens if if there's a sale on some server. I don't know what it is, but um, but uh, yeah, no, we it's funny because we all moved so in the midst of like we didn't know we were going to be making season five so quickly, and it was like we finished season four. We were all in different different the process of buying homes at different times. And we were all sort of like be right before and during the filming of season five, like all of us were moving and we're in Atlanta. So oh it, was, it was a very, uh, it was a, a challenging uh, balancing act. Of what we're, was all, we're all in the exact same boat in, you know, in terms of our work lives and our workload and timing. So it was like, we felt like as soon as season four happened, now is the time to do the thing that's going to like take up a lot of our top personal time and all that. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, season five happens during it. It's crazy. All right, and I guess uh, my my last question, and it's um it's a good one that it's last because it's I'm, I'm sure your answers will be short, but that last twenty seconds of uh, four ten, um Daniel calls some reinforcements. It, that, not something I would have seen coming uh, a million miles away. I, I've done you know my own Q and A's uh, during the the lull uh, prior to season four's release, and people are like, well, what, what are your thoughts if like Chosen comes to the U.S. I go, why the hell would Chosen come to the U.S. Like that makes no sense and. Obviously, we need context. Um, we see how season four ends, and we see Chosen there already in the U.S. Can you what What can you tell us about that? Well, first of all, it's no secret how much we loved uh, Yuji's performance in season three. I mean, we were fans of him in Karate Kid too, but he, we thought that his uh, his episodes uh, were fantastic, and we loved working with him. And from a story standpoint. Uh, you know, where we built to at the end of the season is Terry Silver has taken over Cobra Kai. We know his dreams. His dreams are to expand and to, to go big. And we know how crazy he is and how violent he is and what he's capable of. And Daniel, we felt, you know, learned some things this season ab uh, about finding your own way in karate and you know, recognized that this was a fight that was worth continuing. Yeah, he made some agreement with people who have no honor. And he's he was going to keep fighting on, and it's not going to be easy in his mind. And you know it, he's thinking probably it's going to be silver and crease together. But regardless, this is uh, they're well financed. Uh, they just won another All Valley. Um, this is uh, a, 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 
uh, unpredictable and uh, borderline psychotic uh, opponent. Mm -hmm. Who better to be on Daniel's side than someone who is willing to fight to the death and who is fearless and badass and, uh, you know, damn good at martial arts. So uh, we were thrilled to bring him back and we can't say much about season five, but he's in it. He's at Chosen's in it and Chosen's there and he's great. He's absolutely phenomenal. I'll just I say- forgot where I heard it. I don't, I don't know if it's one of our interviews or I read it somewhere, but somewhere maybe it was Ralph had mentioned that after um, Yuji coming in season three, that he looked at somebody and was like, oh, he, he didn't he didn't think that Yuji's storyline was finished there in season three. Um, so, yeah, we knew we knew yeah, well, yeah. We, we didn't either. And we knew that we were had more in store. We knew that, like, you know, he, he gave him a scroll for a reason. There's all sorts of, you know, things that we have planned, you know, up ahead. But I'll just say this about Yuji and Chosen in season five. Shit's about to get crazy. It's about to get crazy because, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he he's like he's not coming in to do the uh, the paperwork. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> and I saw a scene with John before this interview uh, from season five that involved Chosen, um, and we watched it together. And you know, it, it's 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 amazing where this show is now. Um, you know, you there's things that are happening that you could couldn't have happened in season one. But we've we're here now. We're at this point. Things need to be done. You know, this is a tournament's not going to solve things right now. And uh, it's it's you know, we're it's a crazy journey following these characters, and it's so much fun. Like Yuji brings you know his own energy to the table, but now you can only imagine that in a different environment and all of that stuff. So it's it's if. You know, fans are going to be, you know, love and love what's happening. And, and like we talked about in this interview about how, like, we are always looking for new kinds of things on the show, new reasons for things. So it's not feeling like the same thing. His presence kind of makes everything feel, you know, kind of, um, you know, brings a freshness to, to everything that's going on. So, I, we, you know, I can't I just can't wait for people to see, uh, you know, the crazy shit that's about to happen. <laughs> if the like theme that. of season four with the, the theme that I picked up on anyway, was grow your own way. Right. And that was something that Mr. Miyagi always told Daniel, the roots are strong. You will grow your own way. Hayden, you guys are growing your own way and I will respect it. And I will stop giving you shit when you do things I didn't think were going to happen. <laughs> I promise. You're you can keep giving us shit. <laughs> Be you. Find your own way. Don't don't listen to us. Do do what you want to do. Yes, yes. I'm just telling you. If you're looking into like, well, how old is Miguel? Just stop. <laughs> you're you're barking up the wrong tree. This is Karate Kid. You're going that. You're you just destroyed an entire age. series. I no, was going to do on the is, channel. <laughs> age is a con construct in this world okay just okay. time is is a murky thing just <laughs> enjoy the thing don't be like well how long does it take for somebody to get arrested versus that you're you're gonna just things happen you know brianna this is not she's i the nature of your work and the kinds of things that you do in your time like you're you're a stickler to specifics and uh it, things need to be logical and make sense and we understand that and no, listen, usually okay. it does for us too but we entered the karate kid universe which never made sense in certain ways so that's here we are this is it and that's it <laughs> what do you and, think and is that, is that how we end this we'll take it and now we'll it's yours it. miyagi versus yours and <laughs> run with it we'll follow you no, uh, really created it, the Johnny it, 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 too. It, we'll just end it, this and say, like, you know, you guys have obviously been there since the beginning. A lot of fans that have been there since the beginning. It's everybody's Miyagi verse. I'm all for. I lo we love like going online, seeing theories, seeing things. You know, everybody has their thoughts and opinions on everything, and it's just fun to be on the ride. And like I'm saying, you know, people will have their thoughts on season five, and and, and like that, there's thoughts on season four, but you know. We're having a fun time making this show for 
everybody. And uh, so, you know, we're hoping, uh, you know, just keep watching it, keep spreading the word about it. And next season is going to be the biggest one yet. All right. So we'll end it there. Thank you guys for coming on again, giving us your time, picking your brain as always. Thank you. Love awesome. you guys. Our pleasure. We love talking to you guys. All right. Yeah. So we won't end it like the traditional ways. We just want to thank everybody for tuning in uh, to this interview. Uh, there's many more. And if you just discovered us, there's plenty of others too, to go check out. We have like 86 interviews at this point. So 87 or something like that. Um, so Congratulations to you two. You are episode 200. 200 episodes. Thank you yeah. for 200. Yes. Uh, well, it only makes sense that we're at episode 200, but uh, you know, I'm curious, 300. If that you gotta you gotta build towards that. We'll see who that's gonna be. Okay, you know, right. we can. Do you got to make it. You got to make it. Uh, we got to find a way to get Machio, get Ralph on here. Oh yeah, yeah get, get Ralph, Ralph and, and Billy, Billy again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, get them. Get, get that again. Get we'll do Ralph. You, you know, you'll do Ralph. You'll do Billy. Courtney, uh, Mary. Yeah, Courtney. You get. How about everybody? We just have, you know, trying to. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks everyone for your guys' continued support, and we'll catch you guys next time. All Bye. Right. Bye. Bye.